On behalf of the Arkansas Alumni Association, I want to welcome everyone to this panel that we have called COVID from the Frontlines, where we're going to hear from some friends and alums of the university talking about their work in the thick of the pandemic over the last, ooh, I was about to say, now we're getting out too close to a year, aren't we? But I will first introduce Linda Kuhn, who is the Dean of the Honors College. She is an expert, for those of you who do not know her, in the darkest aspect of the Dark Ages, which was witnessed this week by the arrival of her chapter on conceptions of Jesus in the Dark Ages in the Oxford Handbook of the Merovingian World. And I was like, you usually need to be a man and dead to be in one of those books, Linda. Really great, because the Oxford books are serious. So in addition to being a super engaging dean, who many of you know socially, some of you know as a teacher, she remains a top-notch scholar on top of everything else. And I will turn things over to Dean Kuhn. All right, thank you, Dr. Treat. And welcome everybody. Before I start, I'd like to thank both Renelda Augustine Robinson and John Treat for putting this together, plus our good friends at the Alumni Association who are here with us. And hello, students. Hello, alumni. Hello, Bowden Hammers. We have a hello, all of our friends, Dee Dee Long. I mean, I see so many great names out here. Um, Bowden Hammer scholars, honor scholars, path scholars. Hoot, hoot. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and uh, introduce our four amazing panelists and I'm gonna turn it over to them. And I'm going to moderate the questions after the uh, panelists are done speaking and you can either come on camera and ask if you don't wanna do that, I can read your question in the chat. We're very laid back and flexible. So let me start with Jim Bodenhammer, a Fayetteville native and Little Rock Hall High School graduate. Jim received his undergraduate degree in molecular, uh, cellular and developmental biology from the University of Colorado, Boulder, beautiful place. He then completed his medical degree at the University of Colorado Health Science Center in Denver in 1988. Since completing his residency in emergency room medicine, Dr. Bodenhammer has spent 28 years working in a busy emergency department trauma center in the Metro Denver area. Recently, he's also been working on a small emergency department in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Married to Sue, whom I saw, I think, in the background a second ago. Jim is the father of five children and spends time rock climbing, skiing, mountain biking, and fly fishing. Go Bodenhammers. <laughs> uh, continuing on the Bodenhammer theme, I'd like to introduce to you all Bodenhammer alumna, Rachel Fiore, who's also a doctor, a 2004 graduate from the University of Arkansas in classical studies. Hoot! Rachel received her medical degree from UAMS in 2008. She currently does heroic work at Mercy Hospital in Fort Smith, where she practices general adult psychology, psychiatry and teaches medical students at the Arkansas College of Osteopathic Medicine. In her spare time, which she has little, she's married to Sammy, who's pretty cool, we think, up here in the Honors College. She has two children, Virgil, classical studies, and Josephine, great name, and a dog named Happy. On to another Bodenhammer alumna, and that is the amazing Dennis Copenhager, who I remember very well, who is originally from Texas, but moved to Conway, Arkansas. And luckily for us, came to the University of Arkansas as a Bodenhammer Fellow, graduating in 2006 with a BS in biochemistry. Dr. Copenhaver received her medical degree from the Vial Cornell Medical College in New York City. Woo! She completed her pedagogical training at the New York Children's Hospital at Columbia University Medical Center. She's in private practice in Brooklyn since 2014 and enjoys practicing in her community where she's really put down some roots, but she's coming to us today from the Adirondacks, the Ozarks of New York State, I think. This March, Dennis gave birth to her second child and has been navigating being a parent to two young children and being a frontline worker 
during the corona pandemic. So our doctors, all three of them, are really right on the front lines in various capacities. And then finally, my great honors passport, Peru Pilgrim honors alumna, Caitlin Akel, who graduated from the Honors College in 2019 with a Bachelor of Science in Biology and a Bachelor of Arts in History. Yes! Currently, Caitlin is a second year Master of Public Health candidate at the amazing University of Michigan School of Public Health in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where it's getting cold outside, but I hear it's quite sunny today. At Michigan, Caitlin studies global health epidemiology and researches respiratory vaccine hesitancy in adults. We might be calling on you for our vaccine class this May. So anyway, I'm gonna hand it over to our panelists and you can see that they're all super amazing and gifted members of our intellectual community. So take it away, y'all. I guess I can start if that's all right. Okay, uh, so I'm Jim Bodenhammer. I'm an emergency physician and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to be invited to speak to this panel or with this panel. Uh, I have spent uh, 30, almost 30 years uh, practicing emergency medicine in Denver and now I'm semi-retired in, in a comfortable small rural uh, facility up in the mountains. When I was asked to sort of reflect on my experience with the COVID-19 pandemic, I really, from my perspective, there's sort of been sort of three phases that we've gone through. Um, the first phase is really the initial wave. And in Colorado, that started late February and sort of extended into May. The, um, it was a period that I would consider of great anxiety, mainly because there was so much that was unknown. But it was also intellectually a fascinating period of time while at the same time being emotionally uh, pretty stressful. It was fascinating because we had um, uh, this virus, COVID-19, which while initially would act like a typical flu-like um, uh, illness, it would somehow, in some people, uh, affect different organ systems in a whole variety of ways. And hence, uh, patients with COVID-19 would present very differently. Um, we would have some people who would have no respiratory symptoms who would just present with abdominal pain, diarrhea. We'd have other people with neurologic symptoms presenting with strokes. Uh, we would have some um, patients would come in with chest pain and their EKG and cardiac blood markers would all suggest they were having a heart attack, but when the cardiologist would take them to the cath lab, they couldn't find any blockage that were accounting for their symptoms. And for me, I found kind of fascinating was we would see patients that would come in extremely hypoxic, and uh, that's really where your oxygen level is dangerously low. And a normal oxygen saturation at sea level is about 98%. In Colorado, it's about 92. And we'd see people come in with saturations in the 50s, but they wouldn't be complaining of shortness of breath, which I thought found very unusual. They would complain of being tired or confused. So, so the initial stress with the initial outbreak, from my standpoint, is trying to understand what this virus was doing. Um, the next issue is um, how do we diagnose it? And in the early days, uh, testing was um, almost impossible. There was such limited resources. And then when on the patients that you could test, um, the results weren't particularly helpful because it often took anywhere from four to 14 days to get the results back. Um, and while some people would present with classic symptoms, flu symptoms, shortness of breath, low oxygen counts, and would have classic chest x-rays for COVID-19, vast majority of the patients had variations on the theme. And then, which brings us to the next question is how do we treat patients with COVID? Um, in general, the medical community, um, they get really smart people together and they come up with best practice guidelines. And I can tell you the first two months of uh, our pandemic, our best practice guidelines changed on a weekly basis. And that's probably 
in fact, due to the, that we were had a very rapid rate of learning about what was going on with this, this disease. Um, the classic example was early on um, the use of ventilators. We knew patients with COVID-19, if they were mildly hypoxic or had a slightly low oxygen level, that they were at a high risk for very quickly, like within a couple hours, deteriorating to life-threateningly low oxygen levels. So initially we were, uh, it was recommended that we intubate all these patients very early, put them on a ventilator. Um, later we learned that actually patients probably do better if we can avoid putting them on a ventilator. And there's a variety of other techniques we've been using to kind of maintain higher oxygen levels in these patients. Uh, medications, um, initially steroids were taboo because it suppresses your ability to fight infection. More recently, that's a mainstay of treatment in uh, the sicker um, COVID patients. And then from the first wave, probably for me, the biggest stress was this whole personal protective equipment. Um, I really had two questions. First of all, does PPE actually work? Um, and second, can we get it? We know from the early cases in Wuhan and then the outbreak in Italy that um, we could anticipate probably losing anywhere between 10 to 20% of our healthcare staff in the emergency department due to, during the pandemic due to illnesses um, related to COVID-19. Um, obviously there was deaths associated with some of those, uh, those healthcare providers, unfortunately. Um, and so what was my risk of getting the disease? And then what was my risk of bringing it home to my family? Um, the second issue was regarding, could we get PPE? And um, COVID has changed how we um, use personal protective equipment. Generally in the older days, pre-COVID, we would see a patient with infectious disease. We put a mask on, gowns, gloves, see the patient. When we left the patient's room, we would discard all that stuff. And then when we would, would go back in to see the patient and we would regown. Those days are long gone. Um, we uh, are reusing our equipment. Um, uh, we're rotating our masks uh, to, to be sure we have enough masks and reusing them um, every several days. Uh, in Steamboat, we were getting low on our PPE and we could not find a manufacturer that um, could supply us anything. So we were actually were all backlogged or a back order. So up there, we actually went, a handful of us went to hardware stores and bought Tyvek suits and um, N95 masks that painters use to, to, to protect themselves from inhaling fumes. And that's how we got by in the early phase. The second phase from my perspective is, at least in Colorado, was this summer. And that was a time of relative calm. Um, at that point, because we had just had two months of lockdown, um, our COVID cases had dropped dramatically. We now had uh, ample supply of uh, personal protective equipment. And then testing became uh, easier. Um, and in my facility, we are doing the PCR, the rapid, or PCR, which is the two-day test, the rapid antigen test, which is not quite as accurate, and then antibody test. And then hospitals were not full. So if we did have a COVID patient, um, that we had opportunity to place them in an appropriate facility. And so I consider that summer sort of the calm before the storm, which leads me into where I think we are now. And I think we're at the beginning of the storm. Um, as everyone knows, the number of cases we've seen uh, has increased dramatically, while some of the increased numbers are undoubtedly due to uh, increased testing probably a better metric to monitor is um, our hospitalizations and ICU um, usage. And those numbers have gone up dramatically throughout the nation. And in fact, uh, this week in Denver, which one of the larger healthcare um, provider systems, it has about eight hospitals in the Denver metro area, uh, announced they have no beds, uh, inpatient beds or ICU beds available. Um, and they've canceled all elective surgeries in hopes of providing some space for incoming COVID patients. Um, and then, and, and actually we had a pretty ill innovative COVID patient in Steamboat and we could not find a hospital in Denver that could accept the patient or actually Colorado. So we actually had to fly them out to uh, Salt Lake City. 
So in addition to decreased capacity, now we're unfortunately beginning to find that uh, the availability of personal protective gear is um, uh, becoming hard to come by again. So I am concerned for our next several months coming, moving forward. That's what I got for you, John. Um, I guess I can go next. Um, so my name is Caitlin Akel and I'm currently in my second year in a master's in public health program at the School of Public Health here at University of Michigan. Um, like Dean Kuhn said, I study global health epidemiology, like that's my specific focus within the Department of Epidemiology. Um, I'm in my second year, so I started this program before the pandemic and it's just been really interesting watching the trajectory of this cohort change because we are all like, we're all doing a lot of stuff related to COVID now, um, as opposed to what we were originally doing in our first semester of school. Um, since March, um, things have been kind of different. So first of all, I am not a frontline worker. Like I've never set foot in a COVID unit. I mostly look at data. Um, I do a lot of statistical analysis. The stuff that you see coming out of the New York Times or like, I don't know if you guys follow the COVID tracking project, but that's a, you know, a group out of the Atlantic who take stuff from state reports and compiles them into like a nationwide sort of array of what's look, what COVID is looking like in this country. Um, so I do like, I'm not affiliated with, you know, either of those, but that's more so what I do. I look at data and, but you know, there's um, since March, like a lot of things changed. Like obviously my school went online. And so at that time I was like, okay, well, I would like to do something like I, I need to get involved like I know I don't have a master's degree yet I don't have much experience in public health practice but I need to get involved somehow um and at the time in Michigan I don't know if you guys recall but southeast Michigan was get, would, where Ann Arbor is was getting hit pretty pretty badly particularly in Detroit and like the three counties that comprise like the entire metroplex of Detroit um as well as um, Genesee County and I think Kent County and that's where Flint and Grand Rapids are. Grand Rapids is in the western side of Michigan. But anyway, um, yeah, so I got involved in on a hotline that provide healthcare providers would call um, to essentially report cases to the state department, state health department surveillance system. And I did that for a couple of months until essentially the caseload in Michigan got down to a manageable level and the state of Michigan got to a point where they could start expanding testing, making it more available for asymptomatic individuals, things of that nature. But at the time, like, so I was not, you know, in the hospital readily witnessing like all the rapid changes that were happening with um, treatment protocols and stuff like that. But as we were hearing about it from the physicians who were speaking to us over the phone, like we also had to adapt to um, how we reported cases, what, testing swabs got prioritized over others like if it was like a more like because the the hotline was for um it was for the state public health labs and so they're not readily equipped to test like hundreds and thousands of individual samples that come in from all over the state of michigan they're usually focused like in non-covid times on like monitoring and surveilling clusters of illness that are happening. So like when a hep A outbreak happened, hepatitis A, when that happens, like the state labs usually kind of like investigate that and surveil it. Um, but they're not readily equipped to like run tons of flu swabs, but at, or sorry, tons of COVID swabs. But at the same time, like testing at that time was pretty hard to come by because, you know, we hadn't, it was back in March, like we hadn't expanded too much. And so, the state labs got involved and they were like, okay, well, if you're part of a system that doesn't have in-house COVID testing, meaning they don't have a testing system within that system, or sorry, they don't have a testing system within those hospitals, um, they call this hotline and we report the case, we put it in the surveillance system, and then they send that swab over to the nearest available state lab. And, you know, every couple of weeks, like we'd get like different directives from, um, the people over at the Michigan Health Department, just because things were constantly changing, like at the hospitals, like protocols were changing, at the health department, protocols were changing. Um, so within the two months that I was working on that, like, we just, you know, it was like every week we got a new email and it was like, okay, well, 
if we if somebody is using a private lab they shouldn't report to us anymore so you just like direct them to like the department lab and then eventually that case gets reported later on but we don't directly report those anymore and then like that flipped a couple of times and anyway so um so i did that for a couple of months but and you know since then like i've done like a lot of other like small practice jobs like i've sat in on like a couple of third grade classes and answered questions for students who had who were curious about going back to school in the fall um, <clears throat> and things like that. I currently also work with an epidemiologist over at Michigan Medicine, which is our big med school next to SPH, um, whose daughters, I work with their, her daughter's um, school district on um, developing, I basically like sort of consult with them on developing a return to school program. Because right now I think they have like a hybrid program where like half of the students who want to opt in to go in person like go in person but only for like half a day. Um, even though right now like the state of COVID in this part of Michigan is not really great. Um, but anyway, um, so I do a lot of that and then I throughout all of this I've been a research assistant with a group in the Department of Epidemiology who studies vaccine decision making and before March we were looking at HPV vaccine acceptance in parents, um, particularly in China. But in March, we shifted to looking at COVID-19 vaccine acceptance because we knew that even if like we got a good vaccine and it was deemed safe and effective and it had public confidence and things like that, we were still, the effect of this pandemic on vaccine acceptance in the future, like that's our big question. That's what we're curious about. We wanna know because the way I see it, public confidence, especially in this country towards vaccines is getting very, very thin. And so whenever, or it's, you know, people are becoming less confident over time and things like the pandemic tend to threaten that, especially like with all the new information coming out, the way that science changes and develops, the way that we look at questions, that kind of stuff, if you're, you know, a lay person and you see something on the news and you're like, oh, that's concerning, maybe I won't get this vaccine, even if like there's somebody who you know vaccinated their children or gets a flu vaccine every year or something like that. So we're, our question is, is how is this pandemic going to impact future vaccine decision making? Right now, what we're doing is we are analyzing data that come in every few months from the United States, as well as um, China, Indonesia, um, Malaysia, India, and Taiwan. And this is just where we have collaborators in the group um, on, Opinion, changing opinions on vaccine acceptance towards or COVID-19 vaccine acceptance over time. So every few months we'll distribute surveys into these sites. And really we're just looking for trends. And even though these are like cross-sectional surveys, like we're not following the same group of people over time. We're taking new snapshots each time um, with new samples each time. Um, we can still kind of get a good image. The data from the United States have been really interesting. Um, and we can talk more about that later, but um, so far, I've only really gotten in contact or really gotten experience working with the US data and the China data. Um, I will look more so into the other countries in the coming months. Um, but that's about where I'm at now. So if anybody has questions about the public health side of things or about vaccines or about like fall and winter, because that's going to be another wild ride. Um, yeah, feel free to shout out. All right, Danis, I guess we'll save the best for last and I'll go ahead and go. Um, so I'm a psychiatrist in Fort Smith, Arkansas, um, and I work with Mercy, which is a large multi-specialty health system. And we, gosh, we, you know, we're rolling along very busy. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and we started getting emails from people about, you know, hey, how many patients can you, um, put off how many patients can wait three months for their visit because we don't really know how things are going to go so maybe in three months it'll be fine um you know we don't have enough ppe so we need you to do all of your stuff video um it was really shocking because as a psychiatrist who treats people with mental health problems no visit can be put off three months i mean we think it's appalling if we can't see someone back as soon as we want to so being on the front line of the mental health side of things as opposed to the treating covid side of things I found COVID to be a great pain in the rear end because it was, they, you know, they wanted us to push appointments out or it, we switched to video. We, we tried to be, okay, we're going to just 
They told us we were the um, champions of video, even though I am not technologically savvy because our department just put our foot down and we said, we can't reschedule anybody. We're already three, four, five months out for new appointments. We don't have room to put people. So we, we switched to video. We had full, you know, 20 patients a day via video with all the technical difficulties and fun that that entailed. Um, we, you know, some people love it. At video with behavioral health is just not ideal. Um, not always. Um, you know, it's great when you ask someone how their suicidal thoughts are today and their um, video cuts out as they say, well, it's pretty bad. And then you're just like, oh, super. I'm glad your wife's there. Um, it's been, it's just turned all of our workflows upside down. Um, we've, being a parent, having childcare so that you could come to work and take care of your patients has been a challenge. Um, taking care of people who are really struggling. So um, I have a college student that actually drove from Conway to an appointment in person for a 15 minute appointment last week because she just wanted to do something in person with another human being that wasn't one of her three roommates. Um, we've, it's, this has been really hard on people. Um, I see where some people are advising maybe another shut down and that just terrifies me because I don't think our collective mental health can tolerate that. Um, I know the virus is bad, but suicide rates are up, substance use rates are up. Um, you know, over half of Americans right now rate their mental health as worse than it was before. And we don't have the, we, we didn't have the capacity to treat mental health problems before the pandemic and certainly an increasing need for mental health services, we're not going to be able to accommodate that. Um, so it really, I, it really worries me being in the position I'm in that we're not going to be able to take care of people's, the other side of, of health and wellness, um, the mental health side of things. Some of my patients have been, you know, really good sports about this. Um, and it's kind of interesting. It's the opposite of what you would think. So my sickest patients say with schizophrenia, they're fine. They don't even seem to know that there's a pandemic. Um, I had one lady come in and she was just like, oh yeah, I got my, I said, how's your, how are you doing? Are things really stressful? And she goes, nah, I got my oil changed this morning. I seem to be in better shape than you are. I'm just like, okay, great. <laughs> Good to know. Um, so then people who are typically doing great, come in twice a year, take very little medication are falling apart. Um, it's just been, it's been hard on new moms because they're already feeling isolated at home during maternity leave, which is, as Dana said, not vacation. Um, and now they're even more isolated and they don't have access and they've got this newborn that they're terrified is going to get sick. Um, it's being on the front lines of mental health treatment during COVID. It's just been, it's, it's been a wild ride. Um, we've got patients coming back into the office because like I said, I'm not technologically savvy, and I could tell that a lot of those people needed real human interaction, not human interaction through a screen. And so we've even had people that are high risk in their 70s and 80s that have come in for appointments because they're just desperate for a valid excuse to leave their house. Um, we've had, I've had long, long, long conversations with some of my patients who are in assisted living facilities or are in senior um subsidized apartments that were that have been on lockdown one lady told me that she just she got in trouble because she had opened her window to just scream and the apartment manager didn't like that I was like well they're not letting you leave your house they should let you scream out the window I mean that seems reasonable but they're just they are so isolated um and we've come to the point where some of our seniors are making decisions on whether they want to risk getting sick or give their grandkids a hug and you just never thought we'd come to that in a society like ours but that's where, um, that's where some folks are. So I love that our other colleagues in medicine are making strides and advances all the time um, in treating people with COVID more effectively so that we don't have to be as afraid um, if we do, in fact, get it. I know we're afraid of capacity right now, but we don't have to be as afraid of the virus itself, I think. Um, and that's, that's really comforting. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's, it's a trip to be in mental health right now. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, I'm sure. I, um, so 
I'm Danis Copenhaver. I um, am a general pediatrician in Brooklyn. And the reason Rachel referenced maternity leave is um, I had my daughter on March 5th of this year. She is eight plus months old. She's as old as the pandemic. Um, I probably had one of the very last, what I'm calling like old school pre-coronavirus pre um, births where I like walked in, no mask. We actually kind of like joked about it a little bit with the nurses, which looking back was just naive, obviously. Um, and then within a week, like the world shut down and, um, my like three months to like one of my baby turned into three months of on in New York city. And I think in a lot of places, but in New York city, just ab abject terror, um, just fully at home with my newborn and my four-year-old. Cause our childcare obviously didn't exist anymore. My husband works for the New York times on the business side, but was very working from home and very busy because access to the New York Times just like skyrocketed and he has to keep the news app running He's part of that team. So he was working every day. Um, and I had a, a lot of um, stress, mental health issues, but it was, there was also a lot of guilt that I was not in like working, doing my job as a physician, that I was home keeping a couple kids alive, which and myself alive, obviously, but, um, but I wasn't able to help anybody else. And it was, difficult and um, something I grappled with in the way I kind of did that is New York City or New York State had a weekly conference call that I would log into and listen to about the, the updates and testing and then would try to report back to my office where I work. I work at a small private practice in South Park Slope, which is four doctors. Um, and so I'd report back to them to try to update us like as outpatient doctors, what we could do, which was essentially on, like felt like nothing. And what was interesting with outpatient primary care is just patients dried up, especially in New York. It was, there was no one on the streets when the stay at home order was, was announced. Um, you, no one was outside. You did not go anywhere. Um, literally for two weeks, all we heard were sirens. It was, it was really crazy. Um, I live two blocks from Brooklyn hospital, which was, has been profiled multiple times in a lot of different news organizations about like the number of deaths and like the like mobile morgues and things like that. So it was just constant sirens. Um, and my, my actually my private, my office almost closed because we had so few patients that we had no revenue and we couldn't stay open. So my, the owners of my practice um, actually just reached out to our community and it was very transparent and said like, we are going to do our best, but like we're, we had, everyone went to like half time and half pay and our community really rallied around us and helped us like did a GoFundMe page for your doctor's office, which feels very weird, but like our community, which you think of New York is huge, obviously, but every little neighborhood has kind of their own little doctor's offices and people really rallied around. And then we got denied a PPP loan initially and then got one. And that's what kind of kept our office afloat through the, um, really from mid-March till June, we had so few patients. Um, I returned to work in June and it was pretty slow. And we do, we see all um, checkups are inpatient and we obviously see newborns. And so to keep, families were very scared to come in and very scared to vaccinate, um, Caitlin, kind of like we were talking about. And my office is real, relatively unique in New York is that we have a very strict vaccine policy, when you join our practice, you are going to, you agree to vaccines and you agree to vaccinate on time. So our patient, we, we self-select to a patient population that really wants vaccines, but people were terrified to come in. And in New York, we don't have parking lots to do like drive through vaccines that a lot of offices went to. So we were having some families would like bring their kids to the car seat and we'd run out into the road. And our nurses were amazing and like giving shots and car seats. Um, we did a lot of like virtual visits and the kids would run in really quick and get their vaccines. But we were just trying to do anything to make families feel safe that they could come in and like have their newborns be seen. And so to that end, we stopped seeing sick kids in person completely. Um, what's been interesting is I used to tell parents all the time when they complained of like their kids having runny noses or fevers is like, we can't raise kids in a bubble. They're going to get sick. Turns out we can raise kids in a bubble. It's horrific but no one gets sick. Like <laughs> fever's just like dropped, runny noses stopped. I can't, I mean, so many parents were like, my kid has never been healthier. I am going crazy, but my kid's never been healthier. 
So we are just now since daycares and schools have started in the past two months seeing like fevers and regular colds again. But in the time of coronavirus, what it has stripped me of is my ability to triage in a way that I used to. Like I used to be like runny nose, fever, 24 hours. But in a child who are, thank God, like doing really well with coronavirus, like kids do remarkably well with this illness. Um, they can just have a runny nose, still be infectious and spread it. So every runny nose, every pink eye, every slight fever, we have to treat like potential coronavirus and keep them out of school or keep them out of daycare for anywhere from two to 14 days. Luckily, New York City has really robust testing. So we're able to like send out, we've just started doing like rapid tests in our office. Um, but we're really, you know, we wear, so I also wear full PPE for every well child. Bonnet, gown, N95. And I can still make babies laugh and smile, which is, is just a testament to like how social we are as humans and how much connection we want to have is that in that we can get kids and babies to like really still interact with us, we, even with all our gear on. That being said, they all want to rip the mask right off my face. Um, but it's been, it's a privilege and it's a luxury to see people in person re repeatedly. And I'm often like that moms or dads, like only person they've seen in person for like the week, especially in the early days. Um, but we're, we're doing well. We have like a rhythm. We do virtual. I'm like in and out of virtual and in-person visits all day. We're starting to bring sick kids back in. And then, you know, we're, we're seeing that uptick. New York is, New York City just hit almost 3% positivity rates, which is really low compared to the rest of the country. But in New York City, it can explode so quickly. I think that's where, when we're going to start seeing more shutdowns for school, which is going to be crazy. It's going to be interesting. I mean, um, as Rachel said, like my teenagers are all so depressed. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's been really, um, sh I mean, it's not shocking, except it's shocking to hear that to just like how clearly they can articulate how sad they are and how depressed they are and how they're not sure if they have any hope for anything. Um, but also just like Rachel said, some of my introverts are just happy as clams to be home and not have to see anybody out at school. Same with some parents like this is great. I'm taking my kid to the playground. I don't have to socialize with anybody. So there's silver linings for lots of different people. But New York City is going, we are all a little traumatized from what we went through in the spring. And so we have very good like mass compliance and people really do well. But at the same time, everyone's exhausted and the holidays are coming up. And everyone's asking me about how to travel for Thanksgiving. And my advice is very conservative and most people don't like it, but that's all I can do at this point. Um, but I've been really proud to be a physician in New York. And I like all my colleagues that work in hospitals or outpatient are just really proud of each other and proud of the country, how they backed us up, you know, back in March and April. Um, but yeah, this we're, we're all pretty terrified for the upcoming months. Wow, extraordinary. <laughs> um, zooming in to the pandemic from multiple angles and geographic positionality. That was, I wasn't thinking about that, but then from metropolitan Denver and small town Denver to the Midwest and Ann Arbor uh, to Fort Smith, Arkansas, and then circling back to New York, that was, um, yeah. <laughs> but then also bringing data, bringing emergency medicine, bringing pediatrics, and also, of course, mental health. So that was a uh, very rich. Well, we already have a question, and this is from Regina Hopper, who says, "This is extraordinary. Thank you all for the work you are doing during this very difficult and challenging time." My question is less health-related and more prevention-related. Based on your experiences, what can we do as a nation, mandates or other government-directed measures, technology, outreach, etc to try to get people to understand that their behaviors are directly contributing to the spread. So I'll just open it up to our fine analysts. Well, I guess I would uh, chime in saying that um, the lack of a cohesive national message or policy has been troubling. Um, and uh, problematic. Um, and, you know, I, 
I don't think any particular government would do well in a pandemic. Um, I think we've uh, had an opportunity to really come together as a nation uh, and send out a specific message, you know, based on some science. Um, I think we've kind of fallen short of that. And the mixed messages I think are troubling. So um, I'm not sure I have an easy, I don't think there's an easy answer to that question, um, but I think we could have done better early on. Thank you. Um, I would totally echo what Dr. Bodehammer said. Um, I think from, the, and I also, with the, with the drawback that back in the spring, it was changing a lot. Directives were changing a lot. Things coming from the CDC were changing a lot. We didn't hear anything about, we didn't hear a cohesive message about mask wearing until like the end of April. And by then, like things have been kicking off in the United States till from like late February. So by then people kind of already had like their idea of what to do to prevent this. And I know like a lot of places were on lockdown at that time as well. And so a lot of people were just like, well, I'll just stay home and whatnot. But once places started reopening at that time, like when people started having, like started, you know, gathering their opinions on how to prevent this and like what to do about, um, sorry, I was getting a telemarketer call. <laughs> um, but, um, by essentially that is all to say by like midsummer, like people already sort of had their habits of how to prevent this and like what to do. At this point, I'm not sure what sort of directive we can have that will change the collective conscious conscience. Um, I don't know if anybody else has an idea that they want to share with that, but um, because there's just so many directives coming from so many places. And I do think that there is, you know, definitely truth to a lot of like, especially what we're seeing coming from like public health directives and stuff like that. I think, of course, there's like, I know that those are evidence-based. I know that those are, you know, founded time and time again on science. But at this point, I don't know like what there is to do to essentially change our conscience on um, preventing what is already happening right now, which is currently exponential growth. It's a good question though, and I don't have a straight answer for you. Thank you. Uh, Rachel or Dennis, do you have anything to add? The thing I would add is right now it's, uh, I think it's very individual and it kind of reminds me of how I used to have to counsel people on getting vaccines and vaccine reluctance. It's very individual and that's very difficult when we're just like clearly a very we're obviously we're a huge country with like a very diverse and divided view of many things. And so it's that when it comes down to you as a granular person and what that means for you, whether you own a small business or you have to, you know, your, your mental health or your grandkids or there's so many different individual things that it seems like, well, for you, for me, as a one person, this is what I need to do. But it's so, um, such a web. And especially with COVID that, well, if I get it, I could be fine because I'm not high risk, but who could it affect? So it, I have found that it's really finding that each individual single person's viewpoint and trying to appeal to their individual viewpoint. And it's very inefficient. It's not easy to get an entire country on board. Um, but that's what I found has worked with just like family or friends or people that I've been speaking to, whether either my professional life or personal life. Um, it's just appealing to the individual person and what their needs are. Thank you. I think too, some of the um, return to national activities, if we can kind of, um, I think trying to change the messaging like SEC football is back, but it can't stay back unless people do what they're supposed to do. Like our football game is hanging by a thread this weekend because our head coach has COVID and all these other games are being canceled. So um, I think sometimes using some of those things that were kind of starting to get back and like, okay, they're going to rip that away from us again, unless we all behave ourselves. Like we've got to do our part so that we can have football. And that sounds kind of like, okay, yeah, we've got over 200,000 Americans dead and we're talking about football, but we need things that make us feel normal. And we need things that make us feel like we're going to come through this and that give us hope. And sometimes just being able to put on college football on a Saturday in the fall is all it takes to feel like the world's okay for a little while. And so I think sometimes appealing to some of those things that 
that large groups want to see happen and are happening, but are just, uh, you know, just a couple cases away from being ripped away again. Um, using some of that messaging to say, look, you want to keep watching football on Saturdays and Sundays. You got to, you got to wear your mask. You've got to keep your distance. Yeah. Yeah. Very good responses. Y'all. We have several questions in a row about vaccines, but I think I'm going to ask Monica Morris first. She's very curious to hear what you all think about the Pfizer announcement. I think we all have heard in various media sources about the vaccine Pfizer claims is 90% effective. And then challenges, of course, this is the supply chain follow-up. <laughs> that is, if we do have a vaccine, how do we deploy our complicated supply chain system? So I'll open that up to our talented panelists. Um, I am not an epidemiologist of Caitlin. And, and Dr. Bodenhammer and Dr. Fiore, let me, you know, fill, fill me in. But I feel like my opinion and where, where I've been hearing from like all, a lot of my colleagues is it's very exciting. Like there's no reason to not be like excited and hopeful. I think it's really hopeful to hear that these are panning out in ways that we are, that we're more than what we were excited about. Like I think people would have been excited for a vaccine that was 50% effective. I don't think more than the press release, we, we've had a lot of the like peer reviewed data, like a lot of the granular data that people wanna see to like really get into the nitty gritty of this vaccine. It's also a very unstable vaccine. It is a vaccine that has to be stored at negative 20 degrees, which is a lot of like dry ice and even more difficult like supply chain to um, distribute. Um, it'll be, I think, I think the vaccine, whichever, whether it's Pfizer or Merck or whatever ends up coming out and is available, there's going to be a lot of, I think it's going to have to be tiered or what it seems like I'm hearing from different administrations as well as it'll be sort of like a tiered rollout, with like the highest risk and healthcare workers. And I, my parents are asking me a lot about their kids and I have not heard anything about children, but my guess is they're going to be the last ones because I think they're, because they fare so well and they don't seem to be the super spreaders but also because we tend to get a lot of data before we give things to kids that might ultimately have side effects down the road. I mean, we've been doing this for, for a few months with very small numbers of people. I think children are going to be the, the last ones, the last kiddos to be vaccinated. And that means we're still gonna spread. So it's, it's gonna mitigate things and drop things down the vaccine in general, but it's not unfortunately gonna be like, vaccine return to business as usual. It's gonna be like a, I think a slow rollout with fits and stops, fits and spurts. Um, but that's just kind of what I've been hearing. So I think it's very hopeful and I was very excited, but I don't think it's a, a miracle. Maybe that's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. I would echo what Danis has said. Um, I do wanna stress that a 90% effective level means that in the experimental context, meaning your participants pat, like went through like a physical exam to be accept, enrolled in this study, people had to perhaps be a certain age. Maybe they weren't pregnant individuals. Maybe they weren't, they didn't have a whole lot of pre-existing conditions. A very, in general, healthy study population went into this study. And within that very healthy population, they found the vaccine to be 90% effective which means that in when this vaccine gets rolled out to everybody, everybody who could potentially get it, we might not see as high of an effectiveness rate. I'm not saying this to deter anybody. I do think that I am very optimistic about this vaccine. I personally was expecting it to be like 65 to 70% effective. Um, but I also wanna say like, I also wanna stress that this is what we're seeing in under experimental means. Whenever we enter reality and like, you know, we might give this to elderly people, we might give this to pregnant women, we might give this to younger kids who were not enrolled in this study um, and we might see different outcomes. We probably won't, but you know, we, but we don't have an answer with how this vaccine impacts people in those vulnerable groups. So, that is all to say that the efficacy level that we see from this study might not be the true like effectiveness level, but I am really optimistic that where we are starting from is 90% because not a whole lot of vaccines like have a night, especially like, yeah, a lot of vaccines don't have like a 90% effectiveness rate from vaccine trials. 
So I'm cautiously optimistic about that number because what we're seeing in reality or what we might see in reality is still a really effective vaccine, but maybe not 90%. And um, yeah, so that was basically something I wanna stress with. Um, and then also to, um, I guess, add a little bit more info about challenges to delivering to the vaccine populace. Like um, Dr. Copenhaver said, um, it's gonna be difficult to distribute this, especially with the fact that this particular Pfizer vaccine does need to be stored at like a very, very low temperature. A lot of hospitals don't have that capacity. Like I read an article yesterday where like a lot of rural hospitals don't have that capacity and that's gonna be a problem for a lot of places where, you know, perhaps like the one big hospital system is like in a rural area, like there's like only one big hospital system like for miles. And so um, that, you know, certainly would pose a challenge to the supply chain. Absolutely. But I also do think that it will be a top down approach thing. I do think essential workers um, will have to get the vaccine first, people who are at higher risk for a uh, transmission, people who have to go work in person, I think those will be the people who get the vaccine first. Um, people who typically work from home or like um, Dr. Copenhaver said, children um, probably won't be as highly prioritized. I will tell you guys, I saw Kendall's question about um, neurological problems. I have heard from a few of my patients that this vaccine is going to place a tracker in your arm. And I have it on good authority that that is in fact not true. So um, it should be safe. Um, I know there is some interesting data that's come out. I had some patients ask me about one of the studies and one of the vaccines. And I think it was in, it wasn't in the United States, but maybe in um, South America about, oh, somebody died in the trial. And the headline said somebody in the trial died. But when you look at it, that person didn't get active vaccine. That person was getting the placebo. And so I think a lot of times the public doesn't really understand, you know, they say, oh, science, we need science, but they don't realize that science might change day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute based on what we're learning, especially with a new illness. And so um, I, I I think our, one of our biggest factors with the vaccine is going to be getting people to ignore some of the um, more exciting headlines and actually listen to their um, trusted medical team on, okay, yes, people are going to die whether they're in a vaccine trial or not. And if they're in the placebo arm, it had nothing to do with the vaccine. So don't, don't freak out. It's okay. Um, but yeah, I think that's one of the challenges we have too, is that people get their news bits and headlines and um, vaccine data is not something you can get from a tweet. Rachel, I'd like to follow up on that since we're on mental health, if I may. Uh, as the great psychiatrist Tom Petty said, the waiting is the hardest part. When Dean Kuhn, the honor staff, and I talk, we see the waiting fatigue. We began this semester thinking school will close or things will get better. People have been living in this liminal space for nine months waiting for something to happen one way or the other. How much do you think that's contributing to stress and what can people do about that? That's contributing to a lot of stress. I mean, I, I know there's a lot of um, friends of mine who have kids at school and they're trying to get back into, okay, I'm working, I'm starting to make some progress, I'm starting to roll professionally again, and I'm just waiting until I get that call that my kid's been exposed and I'm back out of commission for 14 days. Um, so I think we are all in this kind of just constant state of limbo and uncertainty and uncertainty is what drives so much fear and anxiety and um, I think some of the things we have to do are look at the wins. Um, Dr. Copenhaver is absolutely right. This one of the most blessed things about this virus is that it seems to spare children. Um, can you imagine if we were seeing death rates in little ones like we've seen in seniors, not to say it's okay with seniors, but I mean, we're not supposed to be burying children. So I think sometimes we have to look at some of the, some of the silver linings, which are, yeah, we've got to protect our teachers, but the kids need to be in school. There's, there's a lot of risks to them for not being in school that are worse than the virus. And so, you know, we're, we're actually making some progress in Fort Smith. We've seen one of our high schools with lots of cases, but they only closed for one day. Um, and, and we're, we're getting through it. Um, I think really trying to focus on some of the positives, some of the wins, um, 
the fact that we are getting kids, we're, they're getting educated again, um, that we're learning a lot about some of our technical capacities to um, reach children, to reach patients um, using the internet, using video. Um, I think now that the election's over, we should all just get off of social media. Um, that would probably be the best advice we could give anybody. Um, we probably should have done that well before the election anyway, but um, that's one of the pieces of advice that I've given patients all along is stop keeping up with COVID numbers day to day. You don't need to be worried about that. Wear your mask, social distance, take care of the people that you love and just you know try to build those relationships with the real people in your life not the social media people and john if i could jump in uh sort of tangentially related but um where i work we do see mental health patients come in in crisis um in the emergency departments and um there was a lull for a little bit um but when we were in lockdown we saw a dramatic increase in hospitals that i hospitalized uh, or patients who required hospitalization for drug uh, and alcohol abuse issues. And I'm not sure whether um, these issues were related to the lockdown or whether they were related to family members being stuck with the addicted person and realizing how serious their addiction is. But in any case, I, I do think um, from some inpatient uh, hospitalization standpoints, the, uh, the pandemic has affected uh, a great number of people. Liquor stores are having record years. So if you own or are invested in a liquor store, you should be having a great Christmas because they are just rolling right now. So that's another thing you should do is not start drinking just because of a pandemic. <laughs> it's, it's not going to be good in the long run. I think we are coming to just about the end of our time. And we said we'd be respectful of our four panelists time today, some of whom are probably eating into their work day and to say thank you on behalf of the Honors College to all of you, to Jim, Rachel, Dennis, Caitlin. Thank you for giving us so much information. And as you said, um, working on the real relationships, Rachel, hearing from people we know or people we have this broader relationship through the U of A through, I think feels very differently. And I want to say a very big, very special thank you to Renelda Augustine Robinson, who is our Assistant Director of Development, whose idea today's panel was, and has certainly been oh, well done. how fabulous all of you were. Dean Kuhn, do you have anything to say on the way out? No, that was, more, like I said, it was amazing. Geographically, disciplinary wise, you guys came to the same subject through all these different angles. Um, super, well, unfortunately, tragically intriguing. How about that? Tragically intriguing. Uh, really appreciate uh, Jim, Caitlin, Dennis, Rachel. Really appreciate you taking your time. You're obviously super busy, super impressive folks. So let's give them that great Zoom clap. Awesome work. And Such thanks a pleasure for to be here. Time. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you, everyone. Windex. I'm jealous. <laughs> Thank you all again. Thanks for coming, y'all.